The first seminar here is going to be about starting the conversation. And I think that starting the conversation is one of the most important subjects because probably the start of the conversation and the end of the conversation are the two most difficult things. And they're also two of the most important parts of soul winning. So when it comes to starting the conversation, it starts, first of all, just when you get to the door and knock on the door. And a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes have to do with mistakes that I've seen. So I'm, I'm not just talking about off the wall, crazy things. These are things that I've really seen. And the good examples that I'm going to use are, are things that have actually happened too. And so over the course of the next couple of days, I'm going to break down everything about how to go soul winning from first getting there to when you leave. But today, right now, I'm just covering only just starting the conversation, just that one thing. But it's an important part of the equation here. So first of all, start with a friendly knock. Now, I've been with so many people soul winning that just... And it, it, it makes people on edge. It makes people nervous. You've already created tension and anger and frustration before you've even said anything. So you don't want to start off on a bad foot like that by banging on the door. So start out with just a nice, normal, friendly knock. And when they come to the door, greet them with a big smile. Be nice. Be friendly. Be personable. Not only that, it's good to say that you're Baptist right away. Because you don't want people to mistake you for being a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or something else. Even if I just go to the door and people just take one look at me before I've even opened my mouth and they're just like, no, and they just go to slam the door. I usually, if I can just kind of get in there and just yell, I'm Baptist, you know, <laughs> just to at least let them know. Because I don't mind people rejecting me, but I just want to know what they're rejecting. Because I've had some people go to slam the door and I said, from a Baptist church. Those are the words I usually yell out or just from a Baptist church. And then they'll stop and go, oh, yeah, come on in. You know, I thought you were the Mormon. So was, in fact, one time I was out soul winning, and this car drove by, and these guys are yelling at us out the window. Ah, you know, I couldn't even understand what they were saying, but they were angrily yelling at us out the window. Ten minutes later, the car pulls around and says, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I thought you guys were Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm a Baptist, too. And he, was a, he turned out he was a saved Christian. And he was just so angry that he thought that we were out spreading lies or false teaching. <laughs> so anyway, I like to, you know, start out, knock, friendly knock, big smile, be nice, and let them know right away who you are. I, the first thing out of my mouth is, you know, hi, I'm just here to invite you to Faithful Word Baptist Church, something along those lines, just to let them know right away who you are and where you're from. And that leads right into the next thing I want to say, which is don't waste people's time. Cut to the chase. I know one thing that irritates me when the Jehovah's false witnesses come to my door is that they beat around the bush. They don't even tell you that they're Jehovah's Witnesses. You have to ask them, you know, are you a Jehovah's Witness? Oh, well, yeah, you know. <laughs> Get out of here. You know? <laughs> but the point is, you don't want to beat around the bush and waste people's time. So, you know, just let people know. It's polite to just let people know right away who you are, why you're there. Be friendly. Let them know you're from a Baptist church. And then you're going to start to ask the person a couple of questions to figure out where they are spiritually. Now, you want to ask questions, but what you don't want to do is interrogate people. And I've seen a lot of people treat this almost like an interrogation, or that's the way it comes across. So they're not smiling, they're not friendly, and then they just start hammering the person with questions. Now, there are some questions that you ask to get things started. The first question that I like to ask is just, are you a Christian? So I knock on the door. Hi, my name's Steve Anderson. I'm from Faith Forward Baptist Church. I just want to invite you to church. Are you a Christian? Now, the reason I like the question, are you a Christian, is that a lot of people are going to give you a positive answer. So then right away, it's like, oh, okay, great, you're a Christian. So that's a little common ground right there with a lot of people. So I just ask them, are you a Christian? Or I might ask them, do you go to church anywhere? Just to kind of figure out where they are spiritually. 
Now, if the person says no, if I say, are you a Christian? They say, no, I'm not. Well, then I don't really need to ask any further questions to figure out whether they're saved. Because if I'm asking, are you a Christian? And they say, no, then they're obviously not saved. So here's the way I look at this. The purpose of asking questions is to learn the answer. And that seems pretty obvious, but I don't like to ask people questions that I already know the answer to. You know, if I ask somebody a question, it's because I'm looking for the answer. So if I ask someone, are you a Christian? And they say, no. I'm not going to say, well, if you die today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Because they just said they're not even a Christian. So therefore, I already know that they're not saved. So if at any point in this questioning process, I know that the person's not saved, then I know I need to present them the gospel, and that's what I'm going to roll into at that point. So what I do is I say, are you a Christian? If they say no, then I say, well, listen, what I'd love to do is just take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that you'll go to heaven when you die. It'll take about 10 minutes. Can I just go through that with you real quick? And then hopefully they say yes, and I can show them the gospel. Okay. If they say, yes, I'm a Christian, then I might ask, do you go to church anywhere? They let me know what kind of church they go to. Gives me a little bit of a feel for what kind of a background. And then I say to them, well, more important than church, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Now, if they give me anything less than a for sure, yes, I know for sure. If they give me anything like, I hope so. Here's the thing. If they say, I hope so, that's not knowing for sure. Or if they say, well, yeah, I think I would. I think so. That's not a no-so. So if there's any doubt of, I hope so, I think so, probably, then at that point, again, I need to present the gospel to this person. So if they give me anything less than a no for sure, here's what I say next. I say, well, can I show you from the Bible how you can be 100% for sure? The Bible says we can know for sure. Can I just take a few minutes and show you from the Bible how you can know for sure? Or can I show you where in the Bible it says that we can know for sure? Something along those lines. So anything less than 100%, I don't feel the need to ask them, well, how, you know, what makes you think you're going? Or what, you know, because I, I want to ask as few questions as possible. You know, I want to ask some necessary questions to, to start the conversation and figure out where they are spiritually. But once I realize this person's not saved or this person needs to hear the gospel, then I just roll right into it. And I ask them first, I say, it, you know, can I go ahead and show you from the Bible how you can know for sure? Can I just take 10 minutes and just run through this with you? Now, when I first started out soul winning, I didn't ask people's permission. When I first started out soul winning, I just showed up. And if they weren't saved, I just started giving them the gospel. And, and I, would, I wouldn't stop until they stopped me. You know what I mean? I mean, I would just, I'd get in there. And I would just preach to them whether they wanted to hear it or not. And until they stopped me, I was just going to keep going. And let me tell you why I stopped doing that. It's because I realized I only have so much time. I only have so much breath. My throat is only going to last so long. I don't want to waste my breath on somebody who has no interest in hearing what I have to say. So I found that, yeah, I could cram the gospel down somebody's throat that had zero interest. <coughs> and spend 10 minutes preaching to somebody who's just glazed over, thinking, like, what do I have to do to get this guy to stop talking to me? <laughs> but what's the point when there's somebody else down the street who wants to hear the gospel? So my mentality is, I'm looking for somebody who wants to hear what I have to say. I want to preach to somebody who's interested in the gospel. So if somebody has no interest, I give them that way out by saying, is it all right if I show this to you from the Bible? Now, I, I, I really want them to say yes. And I, you know, I'll do everything I can to get them to allow me to do that. But I'm not going to cram it down their throat if they don't want to hear it, simply because I'd much rather spend my time talking to people that do want to hear it. Because you'll find, if you go out and knock enough doors, you will find a lot of people who would love to hear that message. Even in the most unreceptive area, you keep going, you'll find people that are thrilled to hear that message. So why waste your time on somebody who's not even listening? In fact, if I'm giving somebody the gospel and about halfway through, I can tell that they're just kind of looking around and zoning out and not paying attention. I'll say to them, hey, I got about six minutes left on this. You, you know, 
Would you like to hear the rest, or are you good for now? You know, because I want to talk to people that are listening. So that's why I asked them if I can show them the gospel. Now, let's start over again. Okay, I get there. I'm from Faith Forward Baptist Church. Are you a Christian? Yes. You go to church anywhere? So-and-so the church. More important than church, do you know for sure if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Anything less than 100%, what do I do? I, I want to show them the gospel, right? So if it's, if it's, even if it's, I probably would, or I'm pretty sure, that's not 100%. Unless they say, yes, I do. Yes, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Now, if they say, yes, I know for sure I'm going to heaven, then I follow it up with, well, what do you think a person has to do to make it into heaven? Now, usually they're going to give you an answer that's very wrong, such as, you know, live a good life, go to church, be a good person, believe in yourself, you know, rescue animals, you know, all the different answers that we've gotten out there of, you know, what they have to do to go to heaven. So when they tell me the wrong answer right there, then I very gently, kindly, and in a friendly way, I say, you know, a lot of people believe that, but the Bible actually says something different than that. Can I just show you what the Bible says? It'll only take a few minutes, only take 10 minutes, whatever. And, uh, but I don't just say, well, that's, that's the horrible answer. That's, you know, you're, you're not even close. You're going to split hell wide open, buddy. You know, because I'm trying to be nice. I'm being friendly. I just met this person. And I don't want to come across too heavy-handed or rude or, or mean or anything like that. And so I, I kindly mention to them that the Bible says something different than that. But usually I'll soften the blow by saying something like, well, you know, a lot of people think that same thing. I've, I, you know, a lot of people told me the same thing. But let me show you what the Bible says. And then I roll into that. Now, let's say they give me the right answer. What's the right answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's what we have to do to make it into heaven. It's all by faith, right? Or, or Jesus did everything. It's his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why I'm going to heaven. It's nothing that I'm doing or I'm earning. They'll give you a good answer like that. Well, then if they give me that great answer, then the next thing I'll ask, the final question is, do you believe that there's anything that you could ever do to lose your salvation? Or do you think it's possible for a person to lose their salvation? Because... You're not going to believe this, but people will sometimes, they'll give you the right answer on the phone. Oh, yeah, just believe. Just accept Christ as Savior or whatever. But then when you ask them that next question of, is there anything you could ever do to lose it? I can't even count how many people then turn around and said, well, yeah, you, I mean, you can't just live however you want. <laughs> you know, it's like they just told you that it's just by believing. It's just by receiving Christ as Savior. But then in the next breath, there's a, well, you can't just live however you want. And what does that reveal? That reveals that they're actually not trusting Christ for salvation, but that they actually have a works-based salvation because they believe that they're continually working to stay saved. And whether you have to work to get saved or work to stay saved, that's the same thing. Now, when I first started out soul winning, you know, I was taught the basic soul winning plan that was around before I was born, Typical, just Romans Road, soul winning, the type of soul winning that my parents did when they were younger, the type of soul winning that churches have done for a long time. And my method of soul winning is, is pretty close to that method. But I'll tell you the big difference. The one thing I tweaked when I started soul winning was that I added that question about eternal security. See, everything else I was taught by others of, you know, asking them where they go to church. Do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? How do you know you're going to heaven? That type of thing. But they never asked that question of, can you lose it? I'll tell you why I added that question. Because I just went soul winning so many times and I would run into people that I knew weren't saved. Roman Catholics, people that are just part of denominations that are uh, very works-based, but they'd give me an answer like, oh yeah, you just have to receive Christ as Savior or accept Jesus into your heart or, or something like that. And they'd give me that answer and I saw so many soul winners that I would be with just accept that answer. Oh, great, then you're saved then. Yeah, that's exactly what we believe. But I'm thinking to myself, this person's a Roman Catholic or, 
or this person's a oneness Pentecostal. You know, these people, they don't believe that that's all you have to do. So I found that that other question of can you lose it, man, that really opened the door to give a lot of people the gospel that a lot of my old soul winning partners would have just pronounced them saved and moved on to the next door when in reality that person was not saved. And make no mistake about it, we strongly believe that if a person doesn't believe in the eternal security of the believer, that person's not saved. Amen. And you're going to hear that a lot at this soul winning conference because that's a key point. And, uh, you know, I don't want to steal my own thunder or Pastor Jimenez's thunder on those points. But we strongly believe that. So when it comes to starting the conversation, that can be a diagnostic question that can help us to realize where people are in error. Now, let's say somebody's not interested. Let's say I go through my questions with them and I ask them, can I show you what the Bible says about how to know for sure you're going to heaven? It'll only take 10 minutes uh, or it'll only take a few minutes, you know? <laughs> and if they say, no, no, I'm busy, I don't have time, that's an answer we're going to get a lot. So just expect to hear that a lot. Don't worry about it. That's normal. A lot of people are going to just not have time and, and not be interested, have no interest. Well, if they're not interested like that, then I still want to leave that person on a positive note. Here's some wrong things I've seen out soul winning with people is, you know, oh, no, I'm not really interested. <laughs> really? <laughs> Whatever. <you know. laughs> I mean, I, I, I've literally, I've been soul winning with somebody and literally the person said, oh, no, thanks. And they just went. Like, they didn't even say bye. They just, they just go like, <sighs> Yeah, who cares whether your soul goes to heaven or hell? Who cares, right? Oh, no, no, by all means, go back to your video game. You know, now, look, we don't want to be rude. Like, that's not going to accomplish anything, having that kind of an attitude, right? Even though we might be thinking those things. <laughs> you know. I'm, I'm cooking dinner right now. It's like, well, really? Because I don't smell anything. <laughs> oh, I'm real busy. Oh, you're busy. So that's why you're holding the video game controller in your hand, huh? Because you're so busy, right? But, you know, we don't want to be rude. So if someone says, oh, I'm busy, no thanks, I'm not interested, take no for an answer, okay? But, but here's what I like to do in that situation, okay? Because remember, I told you in my early days, I would just cram the whole gospel down their throat whether they want to hear it or not. And when I say early days, I'm saying long before I was a pastor, okay, when I was just first getting out there soul winning. I'm like, man, we got to get people saved. And my heart was in the right place, but I didn't realize I was burning up a lot of effort and time that would have been better used down the street with somebody who's actually listening, okay? So if a person's not interested, though, even though I don't want to spend 10 minutes talking to them when they have no interest, what I do want to do is plant a seed. You know, I'd like to take the opportunity to at least plant a seed. So what I often do is say, can I just leave you with one verse? And most people will accept the one verse. Nine out of ten people will say, sure. Yeah, let me just leave you with one quick verse. Sometimes I don't even phrase it as a question. I just say, okay, well, I'm just going to leave you with one quick verse. And I just leave them with that one quick verse. Because I've already acknowledged, though, that I'm ready to walk away, you know? So make sure that they know, okay, no problem. Like, I don't have time. Let them know that you're accepting that. You're taking no for an answer. Hey, no problem. I understand. I'm just going to leave you with one quick verse. Nine out of 10 people are going to accept that verse. And I'll give them a verse. Now, you know, depending on what church they go to, I might use different verses or just, it's really just what I feel like quoting at that moment. It might be John 3.16. It might be Romans 6.23. It might be Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It might be 1 John 5, 13. But just whatever the verse, I quote them that one verse, and then I expound that verse to them in a, in a couple of sentences. I just give them a little truth from that verse, whether it's John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've probably heard that verse before, haven't you? It's pretty familiar to most people. But notice what it says, whosoever believeth. It doesn't say whosoever lives a good life, whosoever goes to church, whosoever does good deeds. Those are all good things to do, but it says whosoever believeth in him should not perish. All right? 
God bless you. Have a great day. Okay. Now, every once in a while, I'll leave them with that one verse. And sometimes they'll give me a reaction that they're very interested in what I just told them. So a lot of times they'll be like, no, no, thanks. I'm not interested. Okay, well, I'll just leave you with one quick verse. I quote them the verse, and then they'll give me a reaction like, oh, wow. That's really interesting. I've never even heard that. I've never thought about that. Wow. Now, if they give me that kind of reaction, then I'll press the issue and I'll say, hey, listen, let me just show you a little more, you know? Have you got five minutes? Have you got 10 minutes? Let me just show. Because I've then sometimes had those turn into a situation where now they are interested, you know? Because it's sort of like the expression goes, the appetite comes with the eating. You know, my wife came to me a, a few mornings ago and, and she wanted to feed me this big breakfast. And I'd already been up at like four in the morning and just binged on a bunch of cereal, okay? <laughs> so I'd already eaten a bunch of cereal at 4 a.m. So she comes at me with this cooked breakfast at 8 a.m. I'm like, no, no, I've already eaten. No, thanks. No, I'm not hungry. No, thanks. And then she's just like, are you sure? You know, and it was like, it was like these poached eggs, avocado and crumpets and, and bacon. So I'm like, well, you know what? I'm just going to eat that bacon. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm too full for the rest. I'll just do the bacon. But you know what? After I ate one piece of bacon, then I ate another piece of bacon. And then I ate the crumpets with the avocado and the eggs and everything. And I ended up eating the entire plate. I'm, I, I even went back for a little more. Okay, why? Because once you start eating, right, you get hungry, even if you didn't really think you were that hungry. And I'm kind of hungry right now, just in case you're wondering. But anyway, the point is that sometimes when you give people that one verse, sometimes they'll all of a sudden act excited and, wow, that's amazing. Well, then at that point, I'd say, hey, sure you don't just have 10 minutes? I'd love to show you the rest. Oh, oh, yeah, sure. And I've had that turn into that. But if I show them that verse, usually you're going to be at the same place you were before the verse was presented. And then you just say, hey, God bless you. Have a great day. Now, especially when you're in Phoenix, Arizona, is this true? Because we have 200 and some people going soul winning every week. We're going to be back at that door again. We'll be back. I mean, there, there are many, many areas that we've knocked six, seven times, receptive areas near our church. Anything within a 15, 20 minute radius of our church, we shall meet again. So, why, so I don't want to be rude and burn that person because, you know, we might be able to let that seed sink in a little bit, be watered, and then come back another time and water that thing again. And so we want to leave on a positive note. Now, let's say I get to the door and the person just right away is sending me strong signals that they have no interest in what I have to say. You know, sometimes you open the door and just from the moment they see you, even after you've said you're Baptist, they want nothing to do with you. You know what? I just, I take off. I leave. Like, if I open the door and somebody just says, I'm not interested, I don't say, you know, well, more important than you not being interested. <laughs> Do you know for sure if you die today, you're going to have it? Yeah. So, like, if somebody, if I just, if I just, hey, I'm from Faith Forward Baptist Church, and they just say, I'm not interested, then I'd say, all right, have a good day. I mean, look, before the, the sentence is even fully out of their mouth, I'm already leaving. Why? Because I have better things to do. I have other doors to knock where people are interested. So if I open the door and I don't even get to my question, I don't get to anything, it's just, you know, hey, from Faith Forward Baptist, no, 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 no. Then I'm just like, all right, have a good day. See you later, right? Why beat your head against the wall when there are plenty of fish in the sea? Just move on to the next door. No big deal. So if they say no, right away, just blow you off, then just take off. Just get out of there. They have no interest. If you go through your questioning and then you get to the point, hey, can I show you? And they're like, well, no, I don't have time, whatever. Leave them with one verse. Expound it to them quickly and then head out unless there's an obvious change that now they're interested. Now, another good thing to do besides just leaving them with one verse that I often do, especially if it's a young person, is I pull out the business card. You know, like uh, Pastor Manley Perry was talking about, the business card has the video with the Bible Way to Heaven on it. Our business cards are a little bit different. They're like a YouTube card. So young people see it right away and, you know, they, they connect with it. And it says right on it, the Bible Way to Heaven. And here's what I tell them. Oh, you're busy? You don't have time? Well, listen, 
Here's a video on YouTube that'll explain to you the same thing. It's only seven and a half minutes long. Would you please just take like seven and a half minutes and just watch this video later? Would you do that? Yeah, sure, I'll watch it. Yeah, I'll check it out, thanks. Usually people are really friendly and, and happy to do that. So I tell them about the video. and say, You know, because a lot of people are just shy, they're nervous, they, they're weird about talking to you at the door, but they might go watch that video if they have an interest. Other people are going to get saved right at the door. There are all kinds of people in this world, so that's why we have all kinds of hooks in the water. We've got the soul-winning hook, we've got the internet hook, because we just want to reach people any way that we possibly can. So the card that has the video link is effective. Don't use it as a substitute for preaching the gospel yourself. I don't want to get all the rewards in heaven. That's my reward if they watch my video. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. Just kidding. But my point is, you know, you need to open your mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Don't leave all the soul winning to me or anybody else, right? You get in there and you show them the gospel. Because you know what? There are a lot of people that would never get saved listening to me. But they'll listen to you. And there are people who would never listen to you, but they'll listen to me. Why? Because everybody's different, and it takes different kinds of people. So God can use us all in different ways to reach different people. So, you know, the video, a single verse, at least that way, you're planting a seed. Now, I've only got a couple minutes left, but what about in your personal life? Friends, family, coworkers. And the best thing about that kind of soul winning is that it's really easy to disciple those people because you know them personally. So you can actually keep helping that person grow. You know, a lot of people that I've worked with and I've won to Christ, I've been able to then ride in the work truck with them and play preaching, popping in CDs of preaching and listening to that or listening to Alexander Scorby reading the Bible with coworkers that I've won to the Lord. Hey, let's learn more about the Bible. You know, you just got saved. And so I've had a lot of great experiences with uh, discipling and mentoring and training people that I won to the Lord that were my relatives or friends, family, co-workers, because you're going to see those people over and over again. So we don't want to only go soul winning door to door, but we also want to do this in our personal life. So when we're talking about starting the conversation, that's relevant to our personal lives as well, right? Because we want to be able to start the conversation on that airplane, start the conversation in the work truck. Start the conversation at a family gathering. Here's a good rule of thumb. If you're alone with someone, give them the gospel. You say, I'm waiting for an opportunity. If you're alone with someone, give them the gospel. That's your opportunity. Now, sometimes if you're in a group and there are a lot of people around, it can be difficult, awkward, ineffective. When you're alone with someone, that is a great time to give them the gospel. So how do you start the conversation? Well, the way that you start the conversation is that you just bring up the subject of church. And that's not a hard thing to bring up. Let's say you're getting to know someone, you're chatting with someone, whether it's on an airplane, whether it's on the job, whether it's with your friends. It, it's not a strange question just to say, hey, do you go to church anywhere? Do you ever go to church? Right? I mean, that's, is that just a crazy question? So that's a pretty natural, smooth way to bring up the subject of spiritual things is just, hey, do you go to church anyway? Or are you a Christian? Right? Now, once you've asked the question, are you a Christian or do you go to church anywhere? Guess what? Now you're back at the door. So here's one of the most important things I learned about soul winning in my personal life. Do it similar to the way you do it at the door. Because I remember before I became a door-to-door -door soul winner, I would try to witness to my relatives, my coworkers, my friends, and I never had any success. I always failed at it, okay? And here's why, because I would just sort of dialogue with that person. And it would just kind of become a discussion or an argument or a chat session. And you just kind of get off on rabbit trails and you're just kind of all over the place. Well, when you go door to door soul winning, you're, you're kind of following a plan. You kind of have a program because you're doing it over and over again, week after week after week, month after month, year after year. So you get good at it. You get in a routine. You get a system down that works. You get methods that work. Well, listen, if those methods work, use them in your personal life. So if you can get to the point of, are you a Christian, which is a super normal question to ask, or hey, do you go to church anywhere? Then you just say, well, hey, more important than that, do you know for sure if you die today, you go to heaven? And then you're right into your normal pattern 
of soul winning that you're used to. So it's, it, it, nothing could be simpler. Nothing could be easier. So the, one of the biggest tips, if I could just give you one tip about soul winning in your personal life is do it similar to the way you do it at the door. The more similar it is, the more successful you'll be because you're successful at the door. You know? And I think soul winning door to door is much easier than soul winning in your personal life. Because when it's door to door, you're thinking like, I'm never going to see these people again. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you don't really care if you, if, you, if you make an idiot of yourself. But you really don't want to embarrass yourself in front of your friends, family, and coworkers. So you're a little more nervous, right? The pressure's on. Door to door is the way to learn. You want to win your relatives to the Lord? You want to win your coworkers to the Lord? You know what? Go door to door soul winning. That's where you're going to get the tools and the skills and the experience that you can turn around and be an effective soul winner in your personal life. That's been my testimony because I failed, 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 failed. Then I got in a soul winning church, went door to door, and then succeeded, 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 succeeded in my personal life because of the fact that I got the experience out door to door. And let me just close on this point. You must truly love people. And the reason I bring this up is because I talked about it at the beginning. Being friendly, big smile, being nice to people. And throughout all the points that I've just given you, a theme of it is be nice, be friendly, be kind, be polite. But I'll tell you what makes this easy. If you actually love people, then being nice and friendly and kind and loving and smiling comes naturally because you're being real. It's actually coming from the heart. Okay. Now, if you do not love people, if you don't have a warm heart and love in your heart as you do this, then it might be a struggle to try to smile and be friendly. And people can kind of read you, even subconsciously, through your body language and the way that you're acting, that if you don't like them or if you don't care about them or if you're just being robotic and you're not really interested in them. But when you truly love people from your heart, that comes across, and people will sense that, and they'll be much more likely to listen to you. You say, well, how can I love someone that I just met? Well, you know, Jesus loved people that he just met. Right. Because if you remember the rich young ruler, it says Jesus beholding him loved him. Right. That guy was an idiot. He was prideful. He was not saved. He wasn't going to get saved. He was self-righteous. But yet, in spite of his sins, Jesus loved him. Jesus beholding him loved him. And you know what? When that door opens, and you don't know who's going to be behind that door, but when that door opens, you've got to love that person. You've got to want that person to be saved. Not so that you can get someone saved, but so that that person goes to heaven because you love that person and you're there to help them. Now you say, what if it's a horrible reprobate? Here's the thing. You've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, they're innocent until proven guilty. You know, maybe, they, maybe it is the most horrible person ever and the worst reprobate spawn of Satan that opens that door. Sometimes that's going to happen. But you know what? You should go into it, though, assuming that this person is ready to receive the gospel. And let them prove you wrong. And I don't care if they're covered in tattoos and they have more piercings than if they fell out of a fishing tackle box and if they are all, you know, gothed out and, and whatever. You know what? So what? So what? You know, can't you love people that are different than you? And we shouldn't just assume that someone is a horrible reprobate just because they look strange. Because we're living in some strange days where even people that are normal people, even nice people sometimes look like freaks. And we got to be able to see past that because a lot, you know, we don't want to just jump to conclusions. Now, if somebody comes to the door in drag or something, it's like, all right, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? I'm going to get out of there as fast as I can if some dude is in drag. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking, but, but look, there are a lot of guys today that are just effeminate and they're not even queer. They're just effeminate. That's the society we're living in, folks. Welcome to 2018 America. And there, so we don't want to just assume the worst and jump to conclusions. Give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, and, and, and go into it with love in your heart for that person. And you have to truly care. You can't fake it. You've got to actually love people and actually care. And that's one of the best soul winning tips. Love people, care about people, 
That's gonna make you do a good job, be thorough. Why? Because you actually care. Because you actually love that person. And you know, people can feel it when you love them. And they can also feel it when you're just going through the motions. Let's bow our heads and have a brief word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the, the job that you've given us, Lord. What a great job to go out and, and win people to the Lord. And Lord, you've committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. You've given us that work to do before your second coming, Lord. Help us to be faithful to do it and help us to do it for the right reasons and with love in our heart and with a tear in the eye. And help us to learn as much as we can over the next three days so we can become a better soul winner. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.